Do, I, I reckon in any piece of work, and that's even in painting and sculpture, there's, at work there's an authorial voice and there's an interpretive voice. And they can be really close. And when they're housed in an auteur, then, then you know, that, that, that the director is authoring the work, writing the work, and then interpreting that work. But because they're close, I think there can be confusion. And sometimes an auteur maybe doesn't have actually the gift of authoring. Of actually, they can have good structural understanding. They could be a good editor or a good dramaturg in theatre. But that's actually different to what a writer does, what an author does, which is actually to generate the, the real momentum of a story. And so you can, through your interpretive skills and your structural skills, come really close to authoring a story. But we see it all the time, the great films where the writing, the actual authoring of the work, uh, is not really there. And so I think the collaboration is actually about trying to understand what the relationship is between authoring and interpreting. And that can go on in one person, it can go on in a collective of artists, and typically it goes on with the writer as the author and the director as the interpreter. And I think film probably really struggles with that because in theatre, what um, you know, Beresford's saying is that in a way the, uh, the director is stepping back from that authorial voice and really sort of trying to open it up, whereas the film director has more control. So I reckon it's a really tricky negotiation on what's interpretation and what's authorship. Mm. And I, I think too what's interesting is that, that still we're talking, we're talking about theatre process and film process and we're still really talking about the director and the writer. But, you know, this is a visual medium. Mm. So what about the cinematographer? Mm. What about the production designer? What well, yeah, about the well, editor? Yeah. Like mm. in theatre we seem to be a lot more comfortable about bringing in those key creative voices at a much earlier stage. One of the things we wanted to do with when the rain stops falling was for Hussain to have as much influence on Andrew. The provocation was can Hussain create images that Andrew has to sort of shift with as the writer rather than Hussain being relegated only to the interpreter of the script. And it was, it, it was tough and it was interesting and in the end I think it happened. Um, and it's really subtle and it's nuanced but it's there I think and Andrew would absolutely sort of feel that it informed the yeah, writer. Yeah, and what was particular about that is that what Chris asked us to start with was nothing. So uh, don't come into the process with an idea that you feel that you want to push. And that went, went absolutely against my nature as a writer because what I'm usually asked to do is be incredibly prepared and have a whole lot of ideas that I can offer. And Chris was saying, can you not have any ideas for a while? And that meant in the absence of having ideas, I actually had to look at Hossein's work and consider it and allow it to affect me. Um, and before I interpreted or decided what it would be or decided how I'd use it or what elements. And that was a gift and, and, and um, seeped through the work. And it also allowed, I think, um, you know, in the end there was a period where, where a, writing, a traditional writing process had to dominate, so we had a show. But right up until that stage, uh, Chris was really encouraging... Uh, writing to, to just hold back so that the other visual elements could be allowed to impact upon the evolution of the work. And it's interesting because it's, it's, it's well, at this point almost impossible to imagine that, that development money in this country could be allocated to something that doesn't exist. It could mm. allocate well, absolutely because, wouldn't happen because, because it only exists if it's a script. Mm. Rather than being able to think in a, in a way that, that I think some areas of the performing arts do. I mean, there's a lot of, of old-school theatre stuff going on, which is Absolutely, about the yeah. script and the director and whatever. We're talking about the development of new, interesting work, and this happens in dance, this happens in opera, mm -hmm. and this happens in all the kind of cross-art forms. We, form we almost lost our funding at one point where we couldn't give them enough answers. Mm -hmm. And we just had to keep making the argument and making the argument, and there's, there was, we had to create steps that we had to jump through. It was... Mm -hmm. you know, but imagine... Is, sorry, just, sorry, just yeah, to finish sorry. the point. Is imagine... <laughs> If you could say, okay, we are bringing in this particular team of wonderful mm. creative people and we're going to give them some development money to play. Mm. And it's going to be a long play, you know. It's going to be potentially two years of playing and there might not be an outcome. But you look at how much money we invest in mm. second-rate scripts being developed, 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 developed forever that are never going to have an interesting outcome. It would be fantastic to perhaps just 
look at the way that, that some areas of the performing arts are able to just generate fantastic new work by taking risks on people and the potential of their ideas. And it might work, it might not. It's actually the, the, the funding application that I put in for the script that I was going to be developing was to work with the cinematographer right. and you know, a number of other people to develop that script, you know, which for me was, I saw as being fundamentally important yeah. to start that work. But yeah, and, and someone like Baz Luhrmann, of course. Sure, yeah. Does it? Well, well, Baz is kind of interesting because uh, he... Um, you know, my first gig on writing a movie was with Strictly Ballroom and... We worked in a room in the old sailor's home in Sydney. Catherine Martin, the designer, had her desk there and I had my desk there and Baz paced between the two as he sort of dreamt up this film. Now, all of Catherine's drawings were being done at the same time as I was writing. So there, were, And he's an absolute... Even though he's a total auteur and uh, quite dominant in the creative process, he's, he absolutely swears by the... By collaboration, um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I mean, to be an auteur in cinema doesn't no, really do that's not that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, a good auteur knows how to collaborate really well. Um, but there's got they've got to be confident in their own vision. You've got to be confident. Like I feel really confident as a writer, and feeling confident doesn't mean I don't ha have insecurities or think that I can't write sometime. But believing in myself allowed me to sit side by side with a visual artist um, and go, what can I learn from you? But, you know, one of my uh, great hopes is exactly what Katrina's talking about, to use the kind of process that Chris developed in When the Rain Stops Falling, but for the outcome to be a film. So the, the key players in that would be cast, would be director, would be cinematographer, um, Production designer. Yeah, yeah. It's you've also got to be careful. Like there are certain times in the process mm. where uh, particular sets of information need to come in, mm. yeah. um, and and too big a group can, you know, you can send it. Be trying to make room for a production designer to make a meaningful contribution uh, um, when uh, it. It might not be the right time. Mm. We had a choreographer involved. He was um, Rowan Mashenko. He was vital to the process because we were in, in our de trying to develop a language for our play. We were trying to be very particular about the way the physical space was used and about the actor's body in space. So having someone like Rowan who could work with the more traditionally trained actors in using their bodies, and I would watch this work. And it would give me an enormous amount of information about how I could talk about using actors in space. But to do that in a film process would be enormously exciting, I think. There's one little observation about what it was like in, as the person who kind of brought everybody together. I, in my own mind, didn't know what the shape of this thing might be, hence inviting a choreographer in as well, and wondered whether in the end maybe there would be minimal text and be much more a visual piece. And... And that was kind of uh, an open book, and there was a point where it became evident where the energy was, and the, so suddenly there were decisions being made that I wasn't even aware of that I was making. Where we invest in Andrew, the writer, it's going to be this kind of work, and those things sort of happened intuitively. So, obviously, that's a really key part of it. And in film with an auteur, I think a, a good collaborator not, is always honing and stripping away, like you talked about, in a more traditional process, which is evident because you can see it externally. Mm -hmm. In a collaborative thing, that still exists, but it's sort of you're peeling it away as you move forward. So you're simplifying, and those traditional roles reconnect, and that's that, you, know, you have to have that, otherwise you've got chaos. Mm -hmm. And Chris was able to continually reinvent the vision or allow the vision to be invented as we worked. So whilst choreography was an important element of the development, it wasn't going to be an element in the final um, work. So, as strong an element, um, sorry. So Chris was able to kind of make that call. Okay, we, we need to go on as this core and let go aspects of the work. But I, I guess just returning to film for a moment, because film development in this country uh, and the levels of subsidy for film in Australia are probably the highest of anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the necessary outcomes attendant to that process is, is box office, how the film mm. will, will ultimately perform. So 
necessarily as a result, because film is the most industrial of all art forms, necessarily, therefore, uh, film is like real estate, ultimately, and, and the proof of a film, film's existence is like bricks and mortar. And necessarily, therefore, uh, it means that uh, the opportunity to, to workshop, to have these kinds of collaborations, and most particularly the one that you've described, uh, is, is, is inconceivable, mm. absolutely inconceivable. So, and I, I guess also, not wanting to digress too much, but even in the fact that there is, you know, the federal arts body, the federal <coughs> arts agency is the Australia Council, and then there's a separate film, a, well, a series up until recently, <coughs> of separate film agencies. And I think, I don't know whether, uh, as is the case certainly with film, where the Australia Council would say to a painter... So we're, you know, we're not actually kind of encouraging people to do watercolours at the moment. We're really <laughs> preferring that you use oils. Uh, so, or the idea that uh, someone has had a wonderfully successful art exhibition and they say, well, you actually need to spend some time with this really wonderful, rather senior uh, painter because that will provide that necessary mentorship for you to get to the next level and perhaps have an exhibition in New York, for example. Um, but look, I guess, I guess uh, at the risk of being, uh, well, I don't know, controversial, but for me, ultimately, I don't care about the collaborative process as long as it's an extraordinary piece of cinema. I don't care about the, uh, the collaborative process as long as it's a remarkable and breathtaking piece of theatre. Um, but I, I wonder also whether Chris and, and, and perhaps Andrew, once again referring to this collaborator, is, is, is that typical? What no. you've just described? No, not at all. What, well, why isn't it? Well, we know, we're talking about theatre. Theatre theater's an enormous thing, too. It is like we're drawing on dance theatre techniques and things like it is. In, so, um, I mean, what the main stage the state theatre companies do when they commission works is they would, it would probably reflect a similar thing to the film culture. There's a commission, mm. uh, that fee is paid, the, the writer delivers, and then the company decides whether they're going to do it or not. And they spend a lot of good money trying to, you know, polish a turd often. Um, and um, and so, even I don't care how something's made as long as it's good either. But my experience tells me that. Um, well, it's easy for me to say because I'm not yeah, a practitioner. I mean, the, I mean, the irony for me is that the brilliance of film that theatre can't do is film can capture those moments of epiphany and performance. It'll capture that forever, and then an editor can put it wherever you want. Mm. Um, and yet, it doesn't take the power of the of the shared epiphany back into the creative process. And again, on this project, this thing is built on us discovering these wonderful moments. Everybody was there going, that was fantastic. So by the time Andrew got to the writing, he was actually writing from such an informed, empowered place that, you know, this is probably arrogant to say, but, you know, it, almost, he, it was so strong, he, you know, he couldn't write a bad piece of work. I mean, of course, it wasn't like that, but that's how, kind of from, not for, me, not for Andrew, but for me it felt a bit that way. There was so much energy behind it. So, you know, you can get lost and go, well, whatever it takes to get there, but that sort of escapes the whole... Question: Because a writer writing for voices, if they don't hear them back at them, and a writer writing for a visual medium, if they don't get to see it, one of the things the same kept saying is, when somebody would say, "Where do you want something?" He'd say, "How can I know till you show me?" And that's the way he works in his own practice. Yeah. And because it's not an industrial art form, he, the financial implications don't stop him doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you take this into the film world because of that one problem, but I think it's relevant to the quality of the work that's re realised. Well, and, and I would say it's a really big problem for film that it isn't seen as an art form. No, no, indeed. Well, that's, it's, that it's, was my suggestion yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a tragedy. Mm. And, and it means that, you know, you're absolutely right. That the, the, for some reason, film has been separated out from the rest of the arts where, in a sense, it disrespects its artists <coughs> and it disrespects its process. I, mean, I, I really think that's the case. It's rigid. It doesn't allow for new things and for new experimentation. And there's, there's a fear of it for some reason. And, you know, you look at what's being exported from this country culturally, like what's really, really interesting, and the stuff that's, that's pushing new ground and actually taking us to places and, 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 you know, putting Australia on the map. It's, you know, it's a company like Chunky Move, who are doing extraordinary work, collaborating with amazing people, using multimedia, using dancers, like just really going for it. No, no, they're, they're, you know, Australian dance theatre. You know, and these are people who are being trusted, they're funded, and thousands of people around the world are seeing these, seeing these works. I mean, it is of... We're getting return for investment, you know? Mm. We're getting real return for investment. And I think 
it's it, this is not a conversation about saying the system is broken. It isn't. I, I think, you know, where we have a real problem is not with the calibre of a lot of our films, but the fact that our audience is not engaging with our films, and I think we really need... I mean, it's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about it next week, everybody. <laughs> uh, distribution and how we deal with it, because, you know, it's crazy. Fantastic films do not get seen. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful, wonderful practitioners <coughs> in this country in every single area of the, of the form. Um, and I've lost my point now. I'll but start. also, James, that, that, that point you said, look, you as a consumer or audience, you don't care. Yeah, I mean, I, but, I overstated that. No, no, I know. Yeah. But um, as makers of the work, it's actually our responsibility to keep examining the means by which we create work. And if, you know, I go back to that point that I started with, that if the means by how we create work, whether that is a writer alone, um, is essentially I start to think that if that's how the writer will work, the play, the form of the play is basically the same. What people put into that form is different according to their own, the story that they want to tell. But the form and the experience for the audience when it's produced by a main stage company or a film that is produced on a low budget with a short shoot time, the same kind of means of production, it essentially produces the same quality. Hollywood has a very particular means of production it's the same film that we are watching because of the form and the structure is the same. Different content, but the same experience, the same emotional experience. Um, but then you look at something like a film like Samson and Delilah that we saw last night. I'm not sure if any of you guys saw it, but if you didn't, make sure you do. It's such a knockout film. And this guy, Warwick Thornton, has gone about that in a different way. Um, he has made it in his own way, and it was difficult for him to do so. Um, for instance, he delivered a 50-page script. Uh, now, that's not a screenplay, a feature screenplay. A feature screenplay has been 90 and 120. But you watch that film, and what's on the screen reflects how it's been made. So as a maker, I'm really curious about the means by which he... he the process he went through, because he's come up with a product I haven't seen in Australia for a long time, if ever, I don't know. As James sort of said this morning, we'd be more familiar with this kind of story telling um, in an Iranian film, perhaps. So I think it's a really vital question for us to be asking. And we are forever e expressing our dissatisfaction at going to another state theatre company show and being disappointed by the experience or seeing another new Australian film and seeing it not quite make it. You know, not wanting to contradict Katrina's point, that there are great films out there, mm. but there are a number of Australian films. Then I think the audience is making a judgment call there. That's telling us that I agree. there is yeah. something wrong with our filmmaking. So the onus is on us to go, okay, what are we doing and how do we do it better? And this, for me, this kind of sense of uh, opening up the hierarchical, hierarchical nature of filmmaking to a more collaborative process may just sort of start producing work of a different quality. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's probably time to, um, to wind up. Please thank Chris, please thank Oscar, please thank Andrew, and please thank Katrina, and thank you very much.